Well, greetings to all my friends from Temple Yeshua. It's been a, a long time since uh, we've been together. And it's a pleasure to at least see you again in some manner. <laughs> I'm glad to be with you. I was speaking to um, your pastor. And he asked me to do something today on hearing from God. It's a very important topic. It's been important to me all my life, certainly. And um, today I'm going to do a bit of a teaching on that for you. You know, as we read the Bible, we see that Adam heard from God. Noah heard from God. Abraham heard Isaac and Jacob and Moses. And the Israelites heard him. Mount Sinai. Joshua heard him, uh, Samuel, David heard him, Solomon heard him, all the Hebrew prophets heard from him, Yeshua heard from him, and certainly his disciples did, and so do many people today, so obviously God wants to communicate with mankind, it's important for us to understand that, God wants to personally communicate with us. I myself came to faith because I was intrigued with the fact that God actually speaks to people. In my case, as I was studying the Bible very early on, it was my forefathers. God spoke to my forefathers. And I decided that if he could speak to them, maybe, just maybe, he could speak to me. And I really, really wanted him to. And so, as I said, being uh, able to hear the voice of God and obey God has been a high priority for me since the time I became a believer almost 47 years ago. So the first thing that the Father wants us to know today is that he wants to communicate with us. After all, what kind of father is it uh, who rarely speaks to his children? What kind of father is that? He loves us. Uh, he wants to teach us. He wants to give us counsel, sometimes give us warning, and certainly wants to watch over us. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you, notice this, with my loving eye upon you. And God does this, of course, not only because he loves us, but because he wants to help us. You know, very often I hear believers say, we don't practice a religion. We have a relationship with God. And that's very true. But what kind of relationship would it be if our father, who supposedly loves us and wants to teach us, uh, to help us, to protect us, to warn us sometimes? What kind of father would he be if he didn't communicate with, it, with us or only does so infrequently? You know, the truth is that he is so eager to speak to us and he speaks so loudly that even the unbelieving can hear him. You know, the scripture declares in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out to the very ends of the earth and their world and their words into all the world. Psalm 19, 1 to 4. And there's a very interesting point that's being made here about God's voice. And that's this. He doesn't always use words when he speaks. And that's why personally I prefer the term communicate because the scripture shows that he can communicate with us in many, many different ways. From the silent testimony of creation uh, itself through providential circumstances. He speaks to us in dreams and visions, sometimes in an audible voice, sometimes by prophecy, sometimes by an inner knowing and so on. 
So there are many ways in which God speaks. So the first point is this. Because God is our father. And he's a good father. He will communicate with us. That's point number one. And he has to do this if he desires to have a warm and an intimate relationship with us and us with him. He has to do this if he wants to accomplish the things that he has purpose to do in our lives and accomplish and have us accomplish the things that he's purposed for us to do. And yet, in the course of the years, I've heard many believers say uh, to me that God doesn't speak to them. Or perhaps if he does, he does so only rarely. Or in some cases, they admit, maybe it's because I don't know how to hear from God. But understanding what the Father's desires are concerning us, believe me, friends, he wants to communicate with us because it's absolutely necessary for our ongoing spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical welfare. He wants to communicate with us. So let's talk about the hearing part of this first and understand a very simple truth. When we come to the Father through faith in his Son, he gives us the ability, he gives us the ability to hear him and understand what it is he's trying to tell us. And the question is, how, how does he do this? Very simply, by means of the spirit that he's placed within us. After all, we remember one of the names of Yeshua is Emmanuel, Im Anu, what Im Anu El for God. Im means with, Anu means us, and El means God, God with us. So he's more than God, friends, who's present uh, everywhere and externally, but he's God who lives inside us, those of us who are believers, he lives inside us as well. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, something you've heard before, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you have received from God? And Paul teaches us in that same letter to the Corinthians in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, verses 11 and 12, he reveals to us how we hear from God. He says, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What you and I have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Why? so that we may understand what God has freely given to us. So God has given us his spirit whereby we might communicate with him and we may understand the things that God has freely given to us. Yeshua says in John 16, verse 13, he says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. He won't speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. So the spirit of God who lives inside us was given to us that through him, God can communicate with us. So that being said, every believer. Every believer, every born-again believer, has the means to hear from God and has the ability to understand what he's saying and has the ability to know the truth. All this by the spirit of truth who lives inside us. 
Yeshua tells us in John 10, in the first five verses, he says that he's the good shepherd. I quote him here. He says, very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and he's a robber. But the one who enters in by the gate, he's the shepherd of the sheep. And the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep, Yeshua says, listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. And when he's brought out all his own sheep, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from a stranger because they do not recognize his voice. So I want us to notice a few things here. First, the shepherd knows his own sheep by name. That is, he knows each of us individually. Um, he speaks to us personally. Secondly, he says that those who are his sheep know his voice. Well, how do we know his voice? Well, first, by his manner of speaking. Yeshua, the Holy Spirit, is not harsh or condemning. And even if he corrects us, his manner may be firm. But it's always kind with the intention of helping us, not harming us. You know, Paul writes a letter to Timothy and he speaks about the servant of the Lord. And when he's speaking about one of God's servants, he, the model for that is Yeshua. And he says that the servant of the Lord, if he follows the example of Yeshua is gentle. He's apt to teach and he's patient. His counsel is, is always according to the teaching and the principles of scripture. And the things he tell you, tells you are always true. The things that the Lord gives you by way of instruction or correction or counsel or comfort or whatever the case may be are always accurate. They're dead on and they're always appropriate to our situation. And I say this for a reason, friends. You know, we can seek counsel from other people. And they can also give us sound guidance from God's word. But is the counsel or direction that they give us, even if it's scriptural, the exact word that the spirit wants to speak into our situation? It's a very good question. You know, sometimes people come to us, they're in distress, we give them a word from scripture. The most important thing of all is that we give them the word from scripture that God wants to give them. That's when the word of God is like a two-edged sword that discerns the thoughts intents of the heart. And so the question is, when we give counsel, let's be attentive to the fact that the counsel we're giving is not just something that flies off the top of our head, but really the Spirit of God is giving that counsel through us. Because, of course, if it's God, signs are going to follow. And when God does speak to us, whether uh, it's within our hearts or whether he speaks to us through others, there's always this inner witness inside us, this witness of the spirit that God has indeed spoken. In other words, there's a sense within us we've heard from God. And a sense of peace and a sense of assurance usually accompanies this. Now, if we're his sheep and we know his voice, then we'll follow him. And we're not going to follow strangers. Now, I know that there's a lot of concern among believers about the possibility of being deceived. But knowing 
and understanding and capital B believing the simple things I've just mentioned here will take away a lot of the anxiety about being misled and facilitate our hearing uh, God when he speaks to us. But friends, though um, we know his voice, though we know his voice in our spirit, man, we must learn to recognize it in our minds as well. And admittedly, as followers of Yeshua, there are several voices we can hear beside the voice of the Lord. There's uh, the voice of our own hearts. There's the voice of human reasoning, the voice of our emotions, the voice of our passions, our interests, our desires, our likes, our dislikes. And then, of course, there are the voices of people whom we consider to be more authoritative than ourselves. And then, of course, there's the voice of Hasatan, the enemy. And finally, <laughs> there's the voice of God's spirit. And how, how do we distinguish which voice is which? Well, I said a moment ago that the Holy Spirit is not harsh or condemning. And his counsel and, and instruction are always according to the teaching and the principles of scripture. He tells us the truth. He never lies to us. He doesn't push us. He doesn't threaten us. He doesn't intimidate us or try to deceive us into doing the things he wants us to do. This is how the devil works. And when we're driven by the flesh, when we're driven by our sinful nature, you can be sure we're being moved either by human reasonings or pride or prejudices and strong uh, and sometimes uncontrolled emotional um, uncontrolled emotions or bodily appetites. But the key here to understanding this is that what we are thinking and doing when we're moved by the flesh is motivated by our desire for self-edification or self-gratification or self-preservation. Now, I want to tell you a little story about hearing the voice of God and sheep knowing the voice of God. And that took place in the village where I used to live in Israel. There was this particular shepherd who used to come through the village with his sheep. It was really quite interesting and really quite amusing. But I learned a very important lesson from this. <clears throat> I talked about how the Holy Spirit is neither harsh nor condemning. And he treats us gently. This man, I thought he hated the sheep. He used to scream at the sheep. Now, I don't understand Arabic, but I'm sure whatever he was saying to the sheep wasn't very nice. But guess what? The sheep followed him because they knew his voice. <laughs> and so it is with Yeshua's sheep, who we are. So the first thing we, gotta, we want to do, if we want to hear the voice of the God clearly, is to go to um, a quiet place. Go to a quiet place. Still our own thoughts and emotions as much as possible. Now, we can't do this all the time, but when we can, it's a good practice. Psalm 4610 encourages us to be still, to let go, to cease from striving and know that he's God. In other words, pushing towards him, trying to pull him down from the heavens in some way, or persuade us to come to him as we're so needy. No, we need to come to a place of rest. Just be still. He's God. He wants to communicate and he will communicate. Sometimes loving God through a quiet worship song is one very effective way to be still. In fact, um, in 2 Kings chapter 3, Elisha needed a word from the Lord 
And so he said to someone, bring me a minstrel. And as this minstrel played, the Lord spoke to him. Another way of sort of uh, <clears throat> becoming a little more focused and calm is to meditate on a passage of scripture. So these are, these are things that, you know, we can learn and we can do. Basically, what I'm saying is get into the presence of God. Okay, get into the presence of God. And I think there's three questions we have to ask ourselves when we're praying on a matter and we're seeking God's guidance. The first is this, what outcome do I want to see? Secondly, why do I want to see this happen? And thirdly, what's moving me to desire this? Whatever it is I'm seeking God's guidance about. Now, if in the course of seeking the answers for these questions, I find that strong personal opinions or other strong desires are influencing me to lean heavily in a certain direction. Whatever outcome I desire and whatever the source of these things are, these distractions, these influences, I have to lay them down before the Lord and come to a place of neutrality before him. In other words, I have to be ready to accept and to submit to whatever is in God's heart when he communicates with me. I have to be ready for that. In other words, I have my ideas, but his ideas are what I'm after, not my own. And in the process of seeking him, we always have to keep in mind that we can hear him because the spirit of God who knows the things of God lives within us. And we will hear from him. We have promises in scripture. Call on me, Jeremiah 33, 33. Call on me, I'll answer you. Show you great and mighty things which you do not know. But we have to understand that not only is it our desire to hear from him, but he desires to communicate with us, sometimes even more than we desire to hear from him. And we need to know that God, when we do this, God always hears us. I mean, here's, here's a duh of a question. How can he not hear us? If by the spirit of God, he lives inside us. And we need to bear in mind that he can communicate with us in many different ways. You know, we make a mistake when we are expecting him to speak. And I put that word in brackets, speak or quotation marks, I should say, to speak to us in a particular way. Like perhaps we're waiting for a prophecy, a vision, a dream, an audible voice, a voice in our spirit. But should he, in his wisdom, choose to speak in a different manner because we've got our eyes focused in a certain direction and our hearts focused in a certain direction, if he in his wisdom should choose to speak in a different way, we can miss it. We can't put him in a box. Perhaps he usually speaks to you uh, through a passage of scripture, but he may not want to speak to you that way all the time. Maybe he wants to expand your ability to, uh, to hear from him by communicating with you in a different manner. So keep your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears open. God can communicate in such a diversity of ways. Now, there are many ways in which God speaks, and I'm going to speak a little more in detail about these things because I think you understand about the more obvious things like the prophecies and the dreams and the visions and the audible voices and the voices in the spirit and the still small voice. God speaks in all those ways. But today I'm going to focus more on the subtle ways he speaks because you know about the other stuff. 
and I don't have to teach on it today. But there are other ways that he speaks that are not as obvious as the dreams and the visions and the signs and the wonders. But they are the more common ways that God speaks to us. The first is what we might call an intuition or a deep knowing that comes from the Holy Spirit. The other is what I will call a spontaneous thought or flow of thoughts that don't always come in the context of what you and I happen to be thinking about at a particular time. So to give you some examples, in the first case, let's presume you've prayed about whether you should follow a certain course of action. You didn't receive a clear word from God about it, but suddenly you knew exactly what to do. You had a conviction about what you were going to do. And you went ahead and you did it successfully. Or you seem to know not to do something based on some kind of Holy Spirit intuition. For example, you take the same route to work every morning. But on this particular day, you wake up and for reasons unknown to you, you decide to take a different route to work only to find out later that possibly you might have been involved in a terrible accident if you hadn't done that. Other times we have what a lot of us call divine appointments. We find ourselves in the right place and at the right time and somehow connecting with people God wanted us to connect with. And there are so many other instances like this in our lives as believers. So this is one way God communicates, a more subtle way, where we're being led as sheep are led by the shepherd, that we're not fully aware of it, or sometimes only in retrospect. In hindsight, do we know it? Then there's this thing about spontaneous thoughts. Now, thoughts in our mind are usually progressive. One thought leads to the next thought. And even if the connections aren't always obvious, what happens? One thought follows another thought. But sometimes thoughts from the spirit can often, not always, but can often be very spontaneous. The he, one Hebrew word for prophecy is navuah, which literally means to bubble up, to bubble up. Words of this nature will bubble up from our innermost being. These spontaneous thoughts seems to come, seem to come out of nowhere, but by the spirit we know that they came from God. That is the Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit you can see the reference about the spirit bearing witness with our spirit in romans 8 so the holy spirit witnesses to our spirit that these thoughts that have just bubbled up have actually originated from him now this is something that's happened to me from time to time this is a story from a long time ago my wife and i were living at the time in BC where you are. We were living actually in Delta, in Ladna. And for many years, my wife wanted to return to Montreal. I did not want to return to Montreal. I loved living where I was loving and I loved the congregation that I was in and I didn't want to go anywhere. And so in a couple of successive years, Florin went back to Montreal for family events for her family. And so every time she would come back, she would say to me, Michael, I want to go back to Montreal. And I would say, absolutely not. Well, this was another time Florin was in Montreal. I think it was for one of our nephews, Bar Mitzvah. And um, she was due back. This was in May. She was due back at the end of May. And I'm in prayer one day. And all of a sudden, I'm, 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 wasn't about this because my mind was made up. I, I didn't want to go back to Montreal. 
so uh, all of a sudden it's it this is how it happened you know this thought bubbles up in me and this is what it is michael when florin comes back and she asks you if you will consider going back to montreal tell her you will think about it now remember never said that before tell her you will think about it and then just like that it cut off and I went back to praying for whatever I was praying for you know it reminds me of we used to have these announcements where they would say we interrupt this program for the following announcement it would be something of local or national concern kind of like an amber alert and so that was one example of that kind of thing happening a third way uh, again a subtle way uh, which often we see in hindsight we don't recognize it when it's happening is when circumstances align in our lives in such a way that our prayers are answered or perhaps a promise is fulfilled according to a prophetic word that we received and sometimes we only know in retrospect that god has done this you know we start at point a and somehow we end up where we told god we wanted to be to use christian language doors open doors close we keep going toward the goal and sometimes we find ourselves in a complete dead end we become discouraged but somehow through some unforeseen event or sequence of events we find our way around whatever happens to be blocking our path and end up where we wanted to be in the first place you know it's like this 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 but we end up there where we wanted to be and the story of joseph is like that how does joseph get to egypt his brothers are you know in joseph's case he has this vision of his mother and his father and his brothers all bowing down to him and he's his dad's favorite jacob loves him gives him the coat of many colors he sends him out to check on his brothers long story short they throw him in a pit then they decide to sell him to some ishmaelite traders going to egypt he ends up in potiphar's house uh, potiphar's wife tries to seduce him he refuses she accuses him of rape or trying to rape her he ends up in prison for 13 years and then this butler and baker come along and and the end of the story he interprets their dreams and then ultimately after a couple of years i think it's the cupbearer or forget which one the cupbearer the baker who remembers joseph and when pharaoh has a dream about the seven skinny cows and the seven sheaves of wheat and he ends up becoming second in command of egypt and ultimately his brothers come down during a time of famine so we watch all these events happening how did joseph get there did he plan this no absolutely not and yet through the aligning of circumstances he understands in the end when his brothers come down there that god has done all this and that's how it goes in retrospect we see this now, as I said previously, God will never say anything or ask you to do anything that's contrary to the plain statements of Scripture or that contradicts biblical principles in general. If the, if the Bible clearly states that something is a sin and the word you receive is otherwise, you should divorce your wife and you know marry some other lady, for example. Or if the thoughts or impressions you receive do not align with the basic principles of scripture then no matter who proclaims that his revelations or her revelations are thus says the lord know that they're not speaking from god nor are they speaking for god you know it says in ephesians 6 17 that the sword of the spirit is the word of god 
The sword of the spirit is the word of God. And I want to explain this to you a little more. I started off by saying that if somebody says I'm speaking by the spirit, but his words don't agree with scripture, he's not speaking from God. That we all understand. If someone claims to be giving a word from God by quoting a particular passage of scripture, but the spirit of God does not agree with this. In other words, the spirit of God does not witness to the fact that this word truly comes from him. Then really, it's only coming from the mind of the prophet. And it's to be rejected. So you see how the spirit and the word are working together. And so, friends, that's why we are instructed in 1 Corinthians 14, 29 to judge prophetic utterances. It means to discern whether or not the content of those things is from God, but also to discern whether the spirit from which that word originates is truly the spirit of God. Okay? There's two things we have to discern here. One has to do with the content of the word, whether it in some way, shape, or form measures up with God's words and his principles in scripture. And the second thing is, as I said, there are people that will come and give you a wonderful, encouraging word. But does the spirit witness that, that that's him speaking to you through this thing? So that's the other part of discernment. In the case, of course, of words that contain predictive elements, uh, if they never come to pass, obviously, um, these words don't come from God. If the words are directive, on the other hand, um, instructing people, instructing you or I to take a particular course of action, then there has to be a witness from the Holy Spirit about this, even if they're given, even if, even if we're being given sound scriptural advice. Never jump to do whatever someone tells you to do, claiming that God told them this for you. Never do that. Don't jump. Wait until you have a witness from the spirit of the Lord about it as well. You know, the scripture says in Deuteronomy 19.15, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. You know, I remember when I was still um, leading my congregation in Montreal, that there was this very lovely Russian woman, very new believer, uh, who would stand up and give a prophetic word. And usually it was one of these words of instruction. She'd say to me, Rabbi Michael, God is telling me that you have to do such and such right now. <laughs> And I, I would smile at her and very gently say, thank you very much. I appreciate this. But when the Holy Spirit speaks it to me, then I will agree and I will do it. Because at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. So knowing what the Bible declares about God, you know, knowing uh, his character, Knowing his modus operandi, the way he operates, will help you discern words which are really from him. He's loving, he's gracious, merciful, he's forgiving, he's righteous, he's just. But we have to remember, above all, that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It's in John 3, 17, very important principle here. And since the spirit, the testimony rather, of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is the spirit of prophecy, tells us that in Revelation 19, 10. The testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. We have to remember, given the nature and character of the Lord, harsh, judgmental, and condemning words don't come from the Holy Spirit, and they should be put aside. James confirms this when he says, 
uh, in James 3.17, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And so at the end of the day, what effect does what you're hearing have on your soul and your spirit? Even if they're words of correction, friends, they're delivered in a spirit of meekness, of gentleness. Words from the Lord are going to stimulate your faith. They're going to increase your measure of peace because you knew you've heard in your joy because here is God communicating with me, a mere mortal. On the other hand, any words, anything you hear, uh, which cause you to fear and to doubt or bring you into confusion or anxiety, even words that stroke your ego, you know, especially if you hear something like, what I'm telling you is just for you alone. No one else is worthy to hear this. <laughs> they must be immediately rebuked and rejected as lies from the enemy. And again, we hear James speaking in James 3.16. And he speaks about the wisdom from below. He says, such wisdom, this wisdom from below, does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. And there's something else I would like to add, and this to me is extremely important regarding this final point about discerning the voice of the Lord. You know, the more time you spend with somebody the better you know them, the more familiar you are with them. And the easier it is to recognize their voice and distinguish it from others. My late grandmother had a very distinctive way of speaking. She had a certain way of pronouncing her S's. And I could walk into a room with 200 people in it. And when my grandmother would speak a word with the letter S in it, I could hear it through a crowd of 200 people. I recognized her voice instantly because of the way she spoke. So the best way to become familiar with God's voice is to spend more time with him. Spend more time with him in prayer. Spend more time with him in the word. Spend more time with him in worship. Spend more time waiting on him silently. Give him a chance to speak. You know, a lot of times our prayers is this one-way communication between us in heaven and God can't get a word in, can't get a word in edgewise. You know, you've met people like that out there. They talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And then they say, well, I got to go now. Nice to be with you, right? And that's the way we are sometimes with God. We have to learn to wait on him and we have to allow him to speak. And the more he responds to you in a manner, in a manner that's familiar and consistent and according to his word, what the word says about his character, the more you'll know that it's him. Finally, when it comes to hearing words, I say, you know, you pray about things, receive answers to prayer. There's a scripture that I feel is very important for a lot of us because none of us is, you know, infallible. But we are all possessors of the Holy Spirit by the grace of God. And sometimes we need the counsel of others. And it tells us in Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So, you know, you receive something, you hear something. We need to remember sometimes that we're members of a body. You know, sometimes fine, we hear from God. We're not 100% sure. We think we heard from God. But we need to remember we're members of a body and nothing will increase 
your faith and your ability to hear from God, like having what you've heard confirmed by two or three other people. Don't be reluctant to share the things you've heard, you know, for confirmation with your spouse, your parents, your friends, your pastor, uh, your group leader, if you're in a, one of these home groups. And these people don't need to be super spiritual. They just need to love you and make themselves available to you. And you know that they have a solid biblical foundation and orientation in their lives. So again, find two or three people whom you trust and let them also confirm that you are hearing from God. Well, that's what I have to share with you this morning. It's been my pleasure to be with you and even for myself to remember some of the principles that I shared with you today. Understand that God wants to hear from you. And God wants to speak to you as much or more than you want to speak to him sometimes. He delights to have a relationship with us. And that relation comes, relationship comes by spending time with one another and just by sit and listening and hearing his heart for us and in the matters which we present to him. So guys, be blessed. Good to be with you again today. And that's all for now. Amen. Mm.